Vlad and learn more about the Black Sea. Thank you, Professor Long. And hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay, I hope everybody can see the presentation. So hello, everyone again. I hope everyone is having a good day and getting prepared for the upcoming weekend, which is very important at the end of the week. So first of all, I wanted to thank the series faculty for giving us an opportunity to present these papers in the midst of pandemics, because I'm a strong believer that each student needs to be heard before he or she graduates. And I do think it's a great chance for us to practice our knowledge and practice our skills one more time. So the topic of my paper is accessibility to the Black Sea cornerstone cornerstone for peace and security in the region, for peace in the region, I'm sorry. The reason why I chose this topic because recent political and geopolitical developments within the Black Sea region show that there are a lot of tensions building up between, between the states that surround the Black Sea. And with all this, it is clear now that it's not so easy for the United States to enter the Black Sea to support its allies or to promote liberal world order. So my paper is making a case, I mean, the thesis of my paper, that the US as the main actor capable of maintaining strategic stability in Eastern Europe needs to deepen existing security partnerships and develop new alliances to preserve access to the Black Sea. The paper is making a case that sophisticated policies are required to, Black sea, to keep the Black Sea region peaceful. And the reason for this is because any action of the United States, even if it is simply a sending of one ship into the region, is being aggressively reacted by Russia. And these ships are being met with fighter jets, with tons of propaganda that can explain how bad it is for the United States to be in the region, period, because it violates, violates the natural order of things. In order to carry out a successful research, I decided to pose three research questions. First one, what is so significant about the Black Sea for surrounding states that triggers competitions and challenges between them? The reason why I'm asking this question is simply because the Black Sea is not the only body of water of these parameters in the world. However, it's one of the few bodies of water that attracts so much attention from the international stage and that causes so much tensions between so many political actors. The second question is, which states are posing a challenge for the United States to freely navigate the Black Sea and support its ally partners? This is a good question to ask when we want to see what kind of obstacles are there for the United States. Because as I mentioned before, 20 years ago, the United States was able to freely enter the Black Sea and to show symbolic support or provide any kind of drills cooperation with its allies without any issues. And the third question is, which states are essential to consider as allies and partners, once again, for the United States? After I identified possible challengers and competitors, I believe it's important to find out these pillars that the United States needs to work on to ensure that the access to the Black Sea is diverse and not dominated by one power without use of any brutal force. The paper is based on the analysis of interviews with experts, academic literature, think tank reports, maps, documentaries, and different conference materials. It's important to, not to know that despite this resource base looks very rich, none of these sources answers a direct question, what, a question, what should the United States do? And none of these sources, unfortunately, offer any policies that the United States can employ in the future to keep the Black Sea region peaceful and stable. So now I want to talk a little bit of my research. As I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, my first research question was why the Black Sea is so important. So the answer is simple and complicated at the same time. We can see that a lot of states within the region, they have huge coastlines and they use the Black Sea for different kinds of purposes, which include security, economy, energy, politics. And this is not an extensive list. I mean, depending on the perspective, we can find many more cases where the states are on how the states are employing the Black Sea to serve their strategies. 
My paper focuses on the security because it's fair to say that the marine power is still one of the strongest arguments when it comes to power projection and one of the best foreign policy tools that can complement diplomacy if one or another state needs to talk with somebody or just promote its interest. As an example, I'll say I'll take Russia, simply because for Russia, historically, the Black Sea is crucially important due to the ability both to project power in Europe and in the Middle East at the same time, depending on their level of the economic wealth in a certain period of history. As I said before, we can talk about economy because economy here is closely connected with free trade energy. Some states like Ukraine, like Russia, they use the Black Sea and its shelf to find natural gas or other states, for instance, Bulgaria to a point, or Ukraine, they use the Black Sea to import coal for other parts of the world. And politics, politics is closely connected with the security because the Black Sea has so many intersection of interest. States are interested in cooperating or competing, depending on their interest. So it's fair to say that the Black Sea is important pretty much for everybody who touches the Black Sea and even for the states that are not directly involved with the body of water itself, like Armenia and Azerbaijan. Because, for example, Azerbaijan is interested in a trade corridor between Europe and Azerbaijan and China and other states. So this is a rabbit hole that requires a whole new kind of paper to discover each one of these topics separately. After we decided, I decided, I'm sorry, that the Black Sea is really important because the evidence suggests that a lot of states are going to continue to use it as a cornerstone for promoting and protecting their interests, we can talk about challengers or competitors for the United States. Here, there, are, there is one obvious answer and one not so obvious answer. First of all, it's fair to talk about rising Russia. If seven years ago everyone was making fun of Russian of the Russian Black Sea fleet and saying it's not capable of doing anything, it's one of the weakest fleets in the world. Nowadays, interview with senior military officials that I was able to conduct showed that the Black Sea fleet is much stronger. However, it's important to know that depending on the person you're talking to, there are two different perspectives. One perspective is that the Russian Black Sea fleet is capable near the coastlines because Russia has anti-air missile system S-400. The other perspective says that the Black Sea Fleet is capable in general because it can dominate the largest part of the Black Sea after the annexation of Crimea. The annexation of Crimea in turn is important to mention because after getting this territory, Russia received two things a huge trading base where it can use to supply military materials or just civilian trade or just for the civilian trade and a huge military base that projects power into the Middle East, in, in, in the Middle East and in Europe. So now Russia is much more closer to every European state and is much more capable to contest the United States, not even in, the, in Eastern Europe, but in the Middle East as well. So the second political entity is the Turkish Republic, the modern Turkish Republic. And this case is pretty complicated because despite being, an, because Turkey is a NATO member, it showed its commitment to NATO many times. However, there are some trends that are concerning for academia, for academics and military officials as well. First of all, it's foreign policy choices of Turkey. There are many things that Turkey and NATO and the United States, they disagree about, and sometimes they result in sanctions from the United States. Recently, we can talk about Turkish purchase of S-400 military systems, which are not compatible with NATO equipment. However, they're fully capable of collecting information about the latest fighter jets that are produced by the United States and are used around Europe. And these disagreements, they can result in tensions when it comes to entering the Black Sea. And why there are why these tensions are even possible? Because of the Monroe Convention that was adopted in 1936. So I don't want to dive deep into the history, but in 1936, the Turkish Republic was a young state. And 
in order to show symbolic support for the legacy of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey was given this convention that granted unique rights on control in the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits. So now without Turkish permission, basically it's impossible to enter the Black Sea without, without notifying Turkey and without adhering to some rules because the Turkish military is capable to, is capable to block these actions. An important case is 2008 Russia-Georgian war, when the United States were, were, was ready to send its ships to the Black Sea to show support to Georgia. Turkey refused to let the ships in for a couple of days before the ships were stripped off to weight, if I'm not mistaken, 10,000 tons each. So they were stripped off some necessary equipment that was considered as an offensive equipment for Russia. And the Monroe Convention is this unique tool that can give Turkey rights to pose obstacles to the United States in, cause, in case of the further deterioration of relations between two countries. Now I think it's time to talk some to talk a little bit about the allies, because unlike the competitors, there are much more countries that want to work with the United States as allies, no matter if they're capable or incapable of doing it by itself. For the topic of this paper, I decided to pick five countries due to the small scope of the paper. And they include three NATO members, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, and two non-NATO states that have a close connection to the body of water itself, unlike Azerbaijan and Armenia, Ukraine and Georgia. So when we talk about NATO members, it, it's obvious that they have great military to military cooperation. Turkey was often called in all official documents and all interviews, the master of the Black Sea because its fleet is so advanced after years of being in NATO and they know the territory, they tend to want to be the regional power and they are not planning to exit the NATO even though it's technically not really possible because NATO gives Turkey a valuable benefit, it can punch above its weight on the regional arena. So it can involve in many military conflicts without serious consequences for itself. Bulgaria is the state that's in the European Union and NATO as well. However, it's a very interesting case. Despite receiving a lot of support from the United States, a lot of trainings, a lot of investments, Bulgaria has very close ties with Russia. So it's one of the contested allies of the United States, just because the Ru Russia is the sole main supplier of gas to Bulgaria. Moreover, it's taking charge, it's taking over the nuclear energy in Bulgaria as well. So, as some researchers from Jamestown Foundation call Bulgaria, it's a place where Russian spies, I and mean, when they were where Russian spies are bred, and the state can be an enemy and a friendly ally at the same time, depending on who wins this contest over Bulgaria. Now, I want to talk about Romania shortly as well, just because Romania has once again great military to military cooperation and it's the most promising NATO state within the Black Sea for the United States. They've been proponents of countering Russian malign influence for more than 30 years. They asked the United States for assistance in modernizing their fleet, their military, into giving them more trainings. And it looks like Romania is aiming to become a second Black Sea stronghold for the United States and maybe to replace Turkey in some like in some perspective. I'm not saying that it's short-term perspective, but there is a potential because they're NATO members as well. And finally, we've got two non-NATO states. The important differences are that Russia threads them, not potentially, but they really suffered from the Russian aggression. They lost territories, their economy is deteriorated, and they're interested not so much in countering Russia within the Black Sea. So there is no competition because fleets of their states are so obsolete, unfortunately, and not capable of responding to this threat. They're interested in restoring their sovereignty and being able to protect themselves from the Russian malign influence. So there is no question about their Western vector. Needless to say, Georgia is one of the closest NATO allies. And despite not being a member state, they have a great NATO to Georgia cooperation that was built up for more than 20 years, during more than 20 years. These states, they're aiming to build some brown water fleets. Brown water fleets are 
small kind of fluids that are capable of defending seashores and are not aimed at projecting any power. And for now, despite general economic prosperity, this is the only option for them. Finally, I can get to policy recommendations. Well, while they can sound a little bit very general, but the United States needs to increase support for Georgia and Ukraine, including the creation of brown water fleets, increase military to military cooperation with Romania to enable it as a second Black Sea stronghold, work with Turkey on revising the Monroe Convention to align with current realities and strategy, and continue the current course of actions with Bulgaria to decrease Russia's influence. The paper reached a number of conclusions that the Black Sea is really geopolitically important for all surrounding states. The Russian Federation capabilities are improving, which poses a significant challenge for the United States to counter Russia. The Turkish Republic and Bulgaria are contested states, despite being NATO allies, and Ukraine, Georgia, and Romania are essential pillars for supporting the diversity of the Black Sea. So basically what we need is some kind of a very tailored approach to each actor in the region. Now I'll open the floor for questions because I love them. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Um, so you started out mentioning that uh, anytime the US um, would move a warship to the Black Sea or move a ship to the Black Sea, it would provoke a Russian reaction. So what do you anticipate Russia's reaction would be to a strategy uh, like the one that you're recommending? So given the fact that the Russian, the Russian strategy itself cannot be traced in any official document and this just our guesses, I do believe that any actions of the United States starting its activities within, within the Black Sea will result in continuing Russian worries about their ability to dominate the region. And the reason for this is because they just got stronger, strong positions over there recently, and they do not feel very secure, according to many researchers. And in this context, any kind of development will result in comments from Russia, their own investments into the Black Sea fleet, their buildup of troops on the Ukraine's border, their closer association with Belarus, it can be anything. So the strategy needs to be gradual at the first place, not to provoke Russia for any bloody conflict, if it is possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, that was, a, that was a great presentation. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, I'm interested, you discussed Turkey's relationship with NATO, of course, and their influence on the Black Sea. Could you discuss a little bit more about the Ukrainian-Turkish relationship? Because I know under Zelensky, we've seen sort of a closing of relations between those two uh, very powerful states in the Black Sea a little bit. Do you think that extends into the Black Sea um, cooperation potentially? And how does Russia sort of perceive that relationship? Well, thank you for this question. This is a great question and an interesting detail about it. It's very hard to find something substantial along the Ukrainian fantasies, which are dominating the media market nowadays about the Ukrainian Turkish cooperation. However, we can see that there are some military drills. So Turkey is supposedly trying to teach Ukrainians on how to operate fleet near its shores and how to counter Russian influence in a more effective way. More importantly, Turkey is the supplier of the non-manned god of drones, let's say it <laughs> in a more simple way. Yeah. And these drones are being used everywhere, not only at the east of Ukraine, but they're capable of patrolling borders. So in these terms, in terms of technology, Turkey is really provide, providing some assistance to Ukraine. However, when it comes to the grand strategy, I'm not sure that this strategy exists as of now. I can say for 100% that the Ukrainian side is very interested in Turkey keeping the Monroe Convention, because, that from, because from the regional perspective, not being able for the United States not being able to send any big ships to the Black Sea promptly will reduce the risk for Ukraine to face escalation from Russia. I know it sounds a little bit complicated, but those are the moving parts that are constantly, and I don't want 
to be to, to, to say the same thing, but those are the moving parts. So yes, definitely there is some place for a cooperation and there is some potential for further cooperation, but it is not a grand project as of now. Dr. Stent. Thank you. Thank you again for a very informative presentation. I learned a lot. My question to you is about the recent Russian moves, aggression um, against Ukraine and Russia cutting off Ukraine's access uh, via the Kerch Strait to the Sea of Azov. Is there anything that the other Black Sea powers could do to counter that? Do you think it would be likely? Is this something that you would recommend the US to do? Thank you for this question, Dr. Stett. It's a very interesting question and it's a very timely question as of now. So the first part of the question, recent Russian movements, for me as a Ukrainian, they're for sure scary because I do realize how big is the Russian military and what is Ukraine's face in, in the case of conflict. And I mean, there were a lot of theories what's going on. Luckily, it looks like this was a mix of views that Russia and Belarus have their regular ZAPA 2021 exercises. And Russia was testing the Biden's administration on their ability to respond to such situation. I mean, recently, the Russian Ministry of Defense said that, they will, that their troops are returning to bases. However, as of now, almost none of the troops return to their bases, according to British sources, according to the United States intelligence and other satellite imagery. And I do think that Russia perceives some dangers in terms of Biden's administration contacting more in Ukraine, engaging in military help, announcing one more package of aid that is more than $155 million. So this was a reaction like, this was a reaction that was aimed at to deterring the United States from the first engagement. And the second part of your question, when it comes to the Azov Sea, it's even more complicated because it looks like from the international point, from the international law point of view, this is an internal sea between two states. And there is not much international jurisdiction and not, not much power that anybody can do anything. In the worst case scenario, I mean, there is always a place for the humanitarian intervention, as NATO members and, United, and the United States called it during the war at Kosovo. However, we do not want this to happen. I mean, this kind of hardcore warfare. And I do think that for now, this question will stay in the limbo because nobody really knows and nobody really has the capability to break the status quo when it comes to the carriage trade. So I know that you conducted interviews with US military officials um, for your paper. Who, who do you think needs to be convinced about your ideas for the US to, to consider adopting some of the strategy you're recommending? So I do not want to say loud words here, but I had a couple of, inter of interviews. And I do think that middle staff needs to be convinced on the level of colonels, because I was lucky to talk even to generals, let's say it's this way, and generals do understand that the war is not an option and there is a need for a gradual strategy. However, this strategy is, as it seemed to me from these interviews, I do not think they're fully representative once again, but these grand strategies, they're undermined a little bit by warmongering and the ability to show who is the boss here. It's not always needed, and there is always a place for diplomacy to be included even into the military sphere. Great. Any further questions from the audience? You clarified everything in a, in a in record amount of time. Thank you, Vlad. <laughs>